Before the highways, there was the prairie, an ocean of grasses dotted by islands of trees. And among the settlers attracted to those trees was one family who left an indelible mark on our history and on agriculture worldwide. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Behind me is a rest stop on I-55 near Shirley, south of Bloomington. A lot of people stop here without ever realizing the importance of this location or of the family name that it bears. On this spot in 1824, Isaac Funk, penniless and in debt, built a cabin on his claim. It took nearly two years before he plowed through enough of the tough prairie grasses and their roots to plant his first corn crop, which he used to feed his growing cattle herd. Eventually, he started driving those cattle north to Chicago, where he helped establish the early stockyard, and where his brother had built one of the first meatpacking plants. Isaac became one of Illinois' first cattle kings. With the money from the cattle, he bought more land, raised more crops, created larger herds, and bought more land. After 40 years, Isaac had amassed the largest, richest soil farm in U.S. history acquired by a single person. He was also a state senator and a founder of the Republican Party, and he was very generous with his knowledge and his money. For example, he helped establish a bank for area farmers, and he built schools and a nearby college. The Funks had 10 children, and their fifth, a son, was the first family member sent away to college. On graduation day in 1863, Lafayette Funk proposed to Elizabeth Paulin, promising to return and wed her once he had built them a home. She waited two years while he and his brothers and his friends built this house. Why not hire a crew? Well, despite the fact that the Funks had millions in assets, they really didn't have that much cash. Plus, they were a hands-on family that really loved the physical labor of building and farming. Completed the same year the Civil War ended, 1865, the house resembles both a mansion and a working farm home. The main drive deposited guests not at the front door, but a side gate which had a carriage step for dismounting. Visitors would then follow a cut limestone walkway to the front door. Considering the Funk's vast holdings, visitors would find inside a very unpretentious home. And while the furniture may look pretty fancy, we're told that it was quite middle class for that period. But the house didn't look like this when Lafayette's bride arrived. It took them 10 years of saving and buying to acquire all these furnishings. The fanciest piece is this desk, which was bought in Philadelphia during the Centennial Celebration. Like his father, he too became a cattle king, raising fields of corn to sell and to feed his herds. And like his father, he too left his mark on Illinois history. Lafayette was the president of two banks, co-founder and director of the Chicago Union Stockyards, sat on the State Board of Agriculture for 29 years, and was chairman of the State Highway Commission. As such, he was responsible for the construction of the first hard, paved road in McLean County, which, interestingly enough, eventually became a part of Route 66. But that wasn't his only appointment, as this painting will attest. Lafayette was a senior chairman of the Columbian Exposition. He suggested that Montgomery, who did this style of painting in return for room and board, show it at the fair. He did, and it was voted as the public's favorite. Next to the living room is the most elegant space in the house, the formal parlor, where guests were entertained. In the corner stands this chickering piano bought in 1867. The company refused to ship it by train, so it was delivered here by ox cart. Compared to the parlor, the master bedroom is almost spartan in appearance. The floor is unpainted with only a throw rug. In addition, because this was the largest room upstairs, it also doubled as the children's playroom. 
Notice that the hat rack is an upturned pitchfork. And yes, those hats were worn by Lafayette Funk. And this is the oldest item in the house, a hand-painted hat box from New York City that dates back to 1801. Each bedroom had its own sink, fed from a tank in the attic. And because the house was heated by a boiler, the Funks had hot and cold running water in 1865. The third tap was for drinking water from a well. Hanging on the wall is this picture from a family trip out west in 1874. Noticing the devastation of the buffalo herds, the Funks decided to help. They brought back a few head, raised a herd, and then donated it to the National Park Service. Another picture from 1915 is from one of the first Farm Progress shows which was hosted by the Funks. One of the speakers was the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture who was so impressed at the Funk's operation, he invited Lafayette's son back to Washington. From then on, presidents from Wilson to Reagan received advice from members of the Funk family. We're in the master bedroom, which I think says a lot about the Funk family. Despite their wealth, it's not an elegant or a showy room, but a comfortable room of a working family. In direct contrast to it is the plushness of the guest room. Here the ceiling and crown molding are covered with stamped tin. Plus, the furniture was specially ordered in 1876 from the same men who made a similar set for President Grant. At the foot of the bed is a built-in jewel box. And beneath the dresser is a hidden drawer that Lafayette used as the family safe. In here he kept the family's most valuable assets the deeds to all their farms and lands. In addition to the sink, there was also a wash bowl. That's because in the 1800s, people were still a little uncomfortable with water that came from a wall. Besides, the pressure was uneven, so the faucets would often burp and spit, which added to people's concerns. Lafayette and his wife had two sons who reached maturity, and as we shall see, they left lasting legacies as well, one in the fields surrounding this home, the other in fields around the world. Remember that picture of the farm show? Over 10,000 people came here, mainly to see the work of and learn from Lafayette's oldest son, E.D. Funk. He founded the Funk's Brothers Seed Company, and was one of the first to apply science in the production of corn. In the beginning, the Funks raised seed the same way they raised livestock, by picking the best and selling it. Interestingly, they shipped the whole ear in a special container, because farmers in those days judged corn by the whole ear and not the kernel. In 1916, along with Dr. Jim Holbert, he created the world's first commercial hybrid corn, and less than 10 years later, his Funk's G-Hybrid was the standard. Many folks still remember the Funk seed signs next to the rows of corn lining Illinois' roads. And Lafayette Funk had another son, who was 15 years younger than E.D., that he sent off to the University of Illinois to study agriculture. Marquis de Los Funk and agriculture never mixed very well, but he did minor in a subject the family had never heard of, something called electrical engineering, and he came back with a head full of ideas. In 1910, he built this structure to house a generating unit, and then he wired every building and barn on the property. He lit the hen house so the chickens would lay eggs longer, and he put lights on top of all the fence gates, and he buried the cable so the wind wouldn't blow them down. Delos also surrounded the family tennis court with lights on concrete poles, and he did the same to the flower garden, to which he added a fountain with colored lights. Inside the house, he built a kitchen island with outlets, designed each of the home chandeliers, and he built a series of mason jar batteries so at night after the generator was turned off, the light by the restroom would still be on. DeLoss also wired all the Funk Farms to a private phone system that he designed. He built his own cars, 
all this and electricity too, before World War I. And when city power finally did reach this area, he wired up all the neighbors' houses. His was an energy that seemed to come directly from a pioneering founder and was nurtured with each generation. And while Funk's seed no longer exists, the work the family began still sprouts anew each spring in fields around the world. Oh, and that grove of trees that first attracted Isaac Funk? Well, unlike the other settlers, he refused to cut those trees. And visitors today can still walk through the largest tract of virgin hardwood timber in Illinois. To learn more about this remarkable family and to schedule a tour of the Funks Prairie Home and Mineral Museum, call 309-827-6792.